Yes, dear friends, it's wonderful to realize that our Father is for us. That every thing and everyone that uh, could be against us has been dealt with by the Lord Jesus at Calvary. And that now our Father is free to bless and free to carry out his heart's purpose for each one of us. All has been prepared by the death and the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is now our Christian life. And even though God, uh, in one aspect, uh, considers us a grain of wheat and uh, handles, us, handles us as such, uh, in the process of it all, it's, it's that he might bring forth a harvest, hard as some of it may be. He remember how he, the Lord Jesus said in in uh, John twelve twenty four, except except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And our Father is taking each one of us as a grain of wheat, and He buries us in His uh, ch choice spot in the ground, so to speak in some situation or circumstance or relationship that the life of the Lord Jesus might spring out of that daily death. Death to self, life in Christ. And uh, our hearts become hungry. We don't, we don't want to abide alone. We want to bring forth fruit. The Holy Spirit places that hunger in our hearts. But in order for a harvest to come, for, uh, come forth, there has to be the process, there has to be a death out of which resurrection life springs. So it all depends upon which view we take. Uh, if we're looking at self and all we go through, or if we're, or if we're looking uh, unto the Lord Jesus Christ and realizing what he's putting us through and why, then our attitude can be completely different. Then instead of discouragement, there's encouragement. Then instead of... Uh, depression and disillusionment, there's joy. I found this little piece of verse years ago. I've often shared it with hearts. It's called Our View and His, where the Christian says, that, I see the stubborn heights, the bruising rocks, and the straining soul, whereas uh, the Lord Jesus says, I see the goal. And I see the tearing plow, the crushing drag, and the beating rain. But he says, I see the grain. I see compressing walls and seething flux and hearts untold. And he says, I see the gold. I see the cruel blows, the chisel sharp, and the hammer's mace. And the Lord Jesus says, I see my face. So all of these things that he's taking the individual through are that he might be manifest in our mortal flesh, that the others might see not us, but the Lord Jesus. That he might see uh, the travail of his soul and be satisfied in each one of us. That he might see his, his face reflected in ours, and that others might see him. That's uh, the reason for everything that's going on. No need for discouragement every reason for encouragement. I, I've uh, taken out of my files here uh, one or two testimonies. Um, I think they're both from missionaries. But it's interesting to see how they uh, came to realize what God was up to. This one uh, dear so says, um, I wish I had been taught that personal happiness is not the goal of the Christian life, not its mark of success. Testimonies and hymns about being saved and living happily ever after seem to be the order of the day. Yet even as a child I couldn't help but sense that some of those who talked most about the joy and peace and satisfaction they had were basically unhappy people. I wish I had been taught that the supreme object of our Christian life on earth is to be conformed to the image of God's Son, 
to be made mature, to have developed within us that character, that capacity for knowing God, in which, glorified in His presence, we shall shine throughout the ageless years of eternity. I wish I had been taught that God will never cease to work, to disturb, to change, to wreck our personal plans, until these things come to pass within us. When I suffered loss, disappointment, illness, frustration, I was afraid and felt that somehow I must have gotten out of God's will. Where were all the joys I had been promised? Would that I had early been taught that I only learned what I only learned decades later to share my joys, to seek my joys in God himself and in all that he sends, to actively cooperate with him in his bringing about of these eternal purposes for me. Well, there, there's a Christian. Of course, it took this person years and years to find these things out. And they got started off in the wrong uh, attitude, which most Christians do. So many uh, evangelists and all and personal workers uh, tell people to come to the Lord so that they'll be happy and that he'll do great things for them and through them and make them successful and uh, make them something. And many, many Christians seek to come to the Lord on that basis, which is basically a, a selfish uh, motive. But when a Christian, when, an, when the unsaved individual is prepared of the Lord to be saved, when there's a deep, devastating conviction of sin that we should pray for in others and wait for in others, then uh, the individual will come to the Lord Jesus uh, on the right basis. Come because he realizes he's a lost sinner and that the Lord Jesus Christ paid for his sin and that the Lord Jesus Christ is to be his personal Savior, to come on that basis, Lord and Savior. Then, on a, in a healthy birth such as that, there's going to be an understanding and uh, there's going to be a submission to him as he takes the new Christian uh, through all of the development that's required for growth, uh, the way up being down, that as we grow, he takes us down to death, that there might be much fruit for his glory. Many come on the wrong basis, and when things become a little difficult and God begins to deal with us so that we'll grow, uh, the Christian draws back, and he's afraid, and he's outraged, and he becomes bitter because he doesn't get all the joy he thought he was going to get and doesn't get all the, everything his own way. And we're not uh, fair to individuals to bring them, to seek to bring them to him an easy way and uh, on the, through the wrong motives. That if we get these dear souls started right, they're going to grow right. And that we won't have so much uh, disappointment and disillusionment and depression about them uh, because they don't grow well. Well, how well did they begin? How, how healthy a birth did they have? That's the uh, important thing. I have another thought here, another testimony about, uh, from a missionary. He says that he recently heard of another missionary who had three terms of service and three furloughs. The first time uh, she went forth to work for God. The second, she went to work with God. But the third time she went out, she went out to let God work through her. And that transition takes years, usually, where we get straightened out and realize that uh, the Christian life and Christian service is not I but Christ. So this missionary says, Now, like the above-mentioned missionary, we too made some surprising discoveries. We thought that God wanted us to make us missionaries, and we found that what God is concerned about is making us Christ-like. As we meditated upon John 15, we began to see that the fruit spoken of there is not primarily the fruit of service, but Christ-likeness of character, the fruit of the Spirit. And that's true that the fruit that God wants to produce in us is the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace. Uh, those are aspects of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the uh, characteristics of his life, his very life. My peace I give unto you, and uh, 
his love and his joy, all of these aspects. And uh, as these characteristics of the Lord Jesus are developed in us, as his life is developed in us, then in turn our service will be fruitful because others will see the Lord Jesus and be drawn to him. The fruit of the Spirit. And this is not human love, but nothing less than God's own love. As we stood before the searchlight of that verse, we were convicted as we began to realize how little of that kind of love we actually had in experience, the love of God that never breaks down, that loves and trusts human beings despite their numberless failures. A yearning was born in our hearts to be more like the Lord Jesus. And that's the yearning that God places in the growing Christian's heart. That even though it means um, death to self, he hungers for the Lord Jesus Christ to the extent that he begins to hate himself his old life. And he begins to glory in the cross that crucifies the old life. So that uh, out of that death, uh, the life of the Lord Jesus comes forth. God spoke again through the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13. He seemed to say, I am not interested in making you a preacher. For though you speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, your preaching will be in my ears only sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Then he seemed to say, I'm not interested in making you a great man of faith. For though you have faith to remove mountains and have not love, you are nothing. Then again he seemed to say, I am not interested in making you a great sacrificer. For though you bestow all your goods to feed the poor and even give your body to be burned, it will profit you nothing if you have not love. And of course, that's the love of the Lord Jesus. From all this, God seemed to say, I'm not interested very much in your service or anything you can do for me. I am interested in you, in you personally. I want you to be Christ-like. Well, that, that's, that's true. That's what every one of us has to find out. Uh, as young Christians, we start out and we, we want to live for the Lord and work for the Lord and serve Him, which is, which is fine, which is good. But we must remember that God uses all of that enthusiasm, He uses all of that love from our hearts to show us that we can't do it. And He does this in mercy. And there's where so many Christians are discouraged and defeated and depressed uh, because they don't understand God's process in showing them that the Christian life and Christian service is Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, reaching out through our lives and touching other hearts. Then when there's a conversion, it'll be a healthy conversion, and there'll be growth. And there'll be multiplication, not simple addition. So when we begin to see what God is up to, there'll be rest and peace, and there won't be uh, darkness and depression. We, 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 as we go along, we learn, we, we realize that we can't uh, form our Christian life, we can't work it out. We, uh, we begin to realize how intricate it is and what's involved. We begin to realize something about ourselves. Well, how that old uh, Adamic nature within us, uh, how e truly evil it is and thoroughly evil. And that in us, in our flesh, uh, there dwelleth no good thing. And that that entire uh, aspect of our, uh, within us, is uh, enmity toward God, and it cannot be reconciled to God. And that we have to exchange all of that for the wonderful life of the Lord Jesus. And we, we finally come to realize that um, only, only our Father knows and understands uh, how sinful we are, even as Christians. He understands. He knows our weaknesses, and he's seeking to bring them out in the open that we might know them too, and that we might uh, turn from our way and rest in the Lord Jesus and uh, in God's way. And he knows all about our past. Uh, many Christians are uh, terribly crippled because uh, they're upset about something that happened years ago, maybe before they were Christian. Something that they did or something that they neglected to do, something maybe terrible. Maybe something in a moment of temptation that was uh, that uh, changed the entire course of their life, so to speak. But it didn't take that life uh, out of God's reach. 
And there may, even as Christians, there may still be results from that or those things that happen that we may have to carry the rest of our lives. But God interweaves and uses all that for our Christian development. God's not against us uh, for anything along those lines, whatever might have happened that would be sin, a terrible sin, possibly. Because when we were born again, uh, God recreated us in the Lord Jesus, and our history, be our history in Adam was closed as far as God is concerned. All the sin, he justified us from all things. And he recreated us in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is now our life. Christ is our righteousness. He's our wisdom and our redemption and our, our, our righteousness. And God sees us in his Son. And we can let the past go. And if there are any reactions and results from that past that are still being carrying out, carried out in our lives today, we, we just realize it's in God's hands and he's using it. So we, God understands the past, and he's done something about it. And God is doing something about the present, uh, pathetic as it may be. Help us as we may feel, sinful as we may feel. And God is doing something about the present. And, of course, the future and, and all eternity, he's got it all worked out in his Son. As we pay attention to the Lord Jesus and uh, forget about ourselves, uh, we're going to begin rejoicing in him, not in ourselves. But that's going to make a great difference in our daily walk in life. And God, God alone, he, our, our Father is the only one who knows when we need child training and uh, when to rebuke us. Often the Lord will allow us to uh, say something to our mate or our children or someone that we may say it in anger or in self-righteousness or uh, may say something that isn't true at all that we don't understand. And uh, God al will allow that to happen. And maybe an instant later, or maybe a week or a month or a year later, we'll be crushed and broken-hearted to realize what we've said or done. And God allows that to show us what we're like and how helpless we are and how uh, tremendous the need is that we learn to abide in the Lord Jesus and look to Him and count only upon Him. And that He alone can guard our tongue and He alone can guard our attitudes and it's His, his attitude and His life pouring forth through us where these things won't happen. But we're not going. To, we, the only way we learn is by God allowing us to go through these things. So it's nothing really to be discouraged about because it's God using it for our own good. It's the very thing He uses to train us and to bring about the exchange life. Not I, but Christ. And He, He, His comfort is the only comfort that we that means anything. Well, how are we going to learn the comfort of God? Well, by uh, going through things and. Uh, the need for comfort is created in our lives. And we, we come to know the comfort of God. And how are we going to be used in the lives of others if we don't uh, understand what others are going through? Nothing to be discouraged about when we go through hard times. These are training periods. These uh, soften us and uh, break our hearts and cause us to be humble and broken and loving and understanding. And we know what others about us are going through. And when uh, neighbors or relatives or whatever, the lost, uh, go through things or weak Christians, uh, they'll understand that we understand. They'll know that we understand. And they'll, they'll, be, they'll open up to us and be free uh, to come to us and uh, be open to what we have to say to them. That, uh, yes, uh, dear friend, I have had that same weakness or I uh, have lost uh, someone or I know what it is to go through that, and there's a, there's a rapport there, there's a, a relationship where God can minister through us. And God alone <clears throat> knows how to mold us and to uh, chisel us and to fashion us and to straighten us and to strengthen us. And he does it through darkness and he does it through light. He does it through all things. <clears throat> And what we're to see is that um, as we simply uh, rest in his hands and let him take us through all these things, that it's only according to his purpose. There's not one thing out of line, out of gear. He doesn't waste anything. And that uh, through all this, he has a dual purpose, and that is to uh, make us more like his son 
and to use us, to uh, prepare us for service. And it isn't uh, a matter of our working for Him. When you think of the lost around us, the, the entire world, the billions of people who are lost without Christ, uh, God understands. He knows all about that. And uh, He has a plan to reach the souls who, whom He has chosen, the souls who will respond to Him uh, from their hearts. And uh, He's training individuals to reach those souls, whether it's in your backyard or in your or at your front door or out in the, the farthest reaches of the foreign fields. He has it all worked out. But He has to have instruments, He has to have souls that are developed in Christ so that He can work through them effectively. And he has to have those uh, that are pliable in his hands and look to him so that he can fit them into his plan that he already has for winning winning souls throughout the world. And not only winning them, but establishing them. Establishing them in himself. So it takes his plan, and it takes us to uh, look to him for his plan, not any of our plans for him. And also his plan takes his power, not our power not all the strength that we can muster. And it certainly doesn't take our worry and fretting, and uh, there's none of that in the picture as far as God is concerned. He, he's, he knows everything that's going on, and he has it all arranged. So it won't do for us to worry about it either. But simply to uh, trust him and depend upon him. And when he... Uh, when he has freedom to work in our lives and to develop the Lord Jesus within us, he'll carry out his purpose through us. He'll be free to do so. For it is God which worketh in us, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. He's the one. There are many, um, many Christians who maybe are older Maybe they're retired, family all grown, and uh, um, maybe retired from lifelong uh, work. Not only of raising a family, but uh, some secular work. Or even possibly retired from uh, Christian service. And many, many Christians uh, today are uh, discouraged and uh, depressed because they feel they're not wanted any longer, not needed. And, uh, well, we must realize that uh, God always uh, wants us and God always needs us. And our Father never uh, reacts toward our age. And uh, he, um, he brings us through many, many, many years uh, just in order to prepare us for some uh, little service that will mean much to his kingdom and mean much to others. Uh, many people aren't in too good a health in their old age, and maybe they can't be too active. But there, of course, is a wonderful ministry of prayer and intercession. And I, I uh, always like to encourage older folks who are in this condition of uh, not being too active and are uh, feeling upset because they're not feel they're not used of the Lord. That there's a wonderful ministry of intercession uh, to um, contact some uh, good sound mission board or get a uh, missionary board uh, magazines and you'll find in there young Christians or new new missionaries going out or those who are older coming home on furlough or who are retired that you can uh, get in touch with through a letter and uh, tell them that you're praying for them and ask them about themselves and get to know them and uh, make new friends in this way. Old veteran missionaries who have been on the field for 20 and 30 years, wonderful new friends, or these young folks who are going out and all that they're going to have to go through to be developed and be really useful. That you can um, get some good uh, growth tracks and uh, good literature that you can from time to time send out to these young ones. You can get their addresses from the mission board or you can be corresponding with them. And there's a wonderful ministry there. And there's no effort included, no real expense at all. And uh, there's no limit to it. There's no extent. My, if, uh, if Christians in general would realize what missionaries are going through and how many missionaries are coming home 
uh, even before their first furlough or at the end of the, at the time of their first furlough who never, never go back to the field, who maybe even leave Christian work altogether, who uh, just do not understand what's going on and they just flounder because they don't realize uh, how God develops a Christian and how God uh, uh, works by dealing with self and taking self down that the Lord Jesus might be all. And many of them break under it. Physically, they break, uh, even have mental breakdowns and spiritual breakdowns because no one has ever told them. Well, I, if there are any of uh, you oldsters, so to speak, who are burdened because you feel that uh, God has nothing for you to do and that others don't care about you. I, I would encourage you even to write me. I, I have uh, files and files here of uh, growth literature that we've uh, sought out and collected uh, for the past 25 years. I could share different uh, tracks or track sources with you and you could gather a few pieces of uh, the finest of uh, growth literature together and you could uh, discover some of these young new ones going out or these missionaries different ones and you could send them just a tract with a tiny note and say uh, I felt burdened to share this with you and then uh, if and when you get a response from that individual you will have a, a basis upon which to work that you can follow through and you can gain some wonderful friends that way who are right on the front lines for the Lord out on the field and there's a ministry of encouragement there, a ministry of sharing things that you've found through your life with the Lord. And uh, how they'll appreciate that individual concern. Some of you have uh, a bit of the Lord's money that you're not too sure what to do with it. Uh, from time to time, you could send them a $5 bill or a $10 bill or maybe $100 if it was really needed. And you could... Um, my, what a ministry there's waiting there for even shut-ins. It doesn't matter a bit. So if you want a little help in getting started, drop me a note and tell me about yourself. And I'd be uh, more than glad, my wife and I would be more than glad to uh, share a few things with you, some pieces of literature to get you started and to tell you some different sources maybe that you could, uh, within a few weeks, you could be having contacts within a month or so. A whole new world could open up to you. And there's no no need at all for being discouraged. Many, many dear friends, especially uh, women, uh, when they get into their 50s and all, become so upset about the, their own personal appearance and all. Or, well, we must adjust with the years. My friends, you should see me. I never was very pretty. But uh, <laughs> that has nothing to do with it. It's our heart that counts. It's the inner man. It's the Lord Jesus who counts. And um, none of these things uh, can hamper us if we take care of ourselves the best we can and trust the Lord to bring us along. And uh, AIDS doesn't matter one bit. It's the oldsters who have been through it and who understand who are the ones that God can use. These uh, early years when we're dashing around and going in every direction at once and all kinds of high flute and testimonies and all, all the things that we accomplished, they don't really mean much at all. They don't stand up. They don't last. It takes years and years and years. And many Christians uh, who are in their later years, they think they're all through and they're just beginning. And God has just, just gotten them to the place where he's put them through enough where they begin to understand things and he's just ready to really use them. And it doesn't uh, mean some world-shaking ministry. God may have uh, brought us along through our entire life uh, just to touch one or two souls. One or two that really count. Uh, think of Henry Varley, who brought the young lad to the Lord, that's just that one soul. He, he, he won many souls, but he'll always be remembered for that one soul that he won, D.L. Moody. And uh, God loves to do big things uh, through uh, tiny, tiny ministries, hidden ministries that don't seem to amount to anything. That's where God is honored. He's honored throughout all eternity. 
and things like that. So there's no use to be in dis uh, the least bit discouraged about age. Or even if you feel that you've failed your entire life and never never amounted to anything, well, fine. That gets you on. That has you on the proper ground where the Lord Jesus can be something. That's just where He wanted to bring you, where you know you can't do anything, and that if anything's be done through you, He must do it. That's the right attitude. That's where He wants us. And it may have taken you 40 years to find that out. It takes most Christians at least 20, 30 years to find it out anyway. So there's no discouragement or depression uh, required there at all in our age. Uh, the Lord uh, saw fit to allow me to have a heart condition. Uh, I used to be an athlete and all, and uh, somewhere along the line I injured my heart. So that I have to adjust and I have to be careful, and I'm limited in many ways. But I'm not limited to the extent that I can't uh, put in 12 and 14 hours a day at the desk here, six days a week, and I've been doing that for 20 years. And uh, the Lord is not limited, even with limitations. He, he, he likes to work through limitations uh, to really accomplish things uh, through those that are nothing, the, the weak things, the base things. Oh, it's wonderful, dear friends, to be nothing then you've got nothing to lose. Then the Lord Jesus can be everything. Well, now there's a very important area, I think one of the most important areas that we must uh, think about for a bit here about this matter of discouragement and depression, and that is in the matter of uh, the Christian's conscience. That... Uh, this is the most prevalent thing of all. This is behind uh, most of the trouble in uh, Christians going through periods of darkness and uh, where they're just helpless. And it has so much to do with conscience. Where um, Christians, so many get off to a poor beginning in their Christian life where they've been talked into something maybe and there wasn't a really healthy birth they just got started and that's all and no one helped them grow and they weren't uh, some have come along for many years and uh, not even too sure not even too really sure that they're saved don't really have a full assurance of their salvation and uh, that's crippling that keeps them on uh, keeps them in a difficult position all the time, that constant fear in their heart. Well, am I really saved? Do I really belong to the Lord? A terrible thing to have happen to a Christian, where every Christian can be uh, sure, whether, uh, sure that he's saved and have full assurance simply by uh, resting upon the Word and not going by what he is in himself that uh, through this man Christ Jesus is, was preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, that by him all that believe are justified from all things. Justified from all things. And that the Lord Jesus paid the price in full. I think that the, the greatest problem in, Christian, in amongst Christians today is a poor beginning. They're not really depending upon the word of God as, as, as far as their salvation is concerned. And then, uh, of course, even those, uh, there are many Christians who, sure, who are sure they're saved, but um, they're having trouble about whether or not, uh, about God's attitude uh, toward them while they're growing in their Christian life. That um, because God has to deal with us while we're growing, and he has to chastise us and uh, child train us and take us through things that are difficult in order to develop us, that the Christian feels that uh, because God has to handle him this way that something's wrong. That uh, God must be upset about him and God must be uh, mad at him. No, and he feels that, well, maybe God doesn't accept me and that he has to treat me this way because of the way I am. And uh, Christians, so many do not realize that uh, God fully accepts them that the instant that they're saved. And he accepts them as they are. 
And the reason he's able to accept us, the just and holy God, the reason he's able to accept us is because he's placed us in his Son. He's recreated us. We're born anew. And we're fully accepted in the Lord Jesus. Having predestinated, predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Well, now there's another aspect of our Christian life that we have to be sure about before we can enjoy a clear conscience before God, and that has to do with our eternal security. That when the Christian is sure of his salvation and he's sure that he's accepted in the Lord Jesus, then he's ready to realize that he is eternal, eternally secure in him. That there's no, no conditions for him to remain secure to remain eternally saved, but that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, keeps him, that the uh, death and life of the Lord Jesus Christ keeps him forever. And ours is to, our responsibility is simply to uh, rest in the Lord Jesus and what he's done for us and who he is to us and our uh, relationship to him. There, there's our security. He's our security. His life is our security. His eternal life. And the believer who rests, simply rests in, in the Son of God, he, he'll come to know that he's eternally secure. And uh, we think here of uh, Romans 5.11. But not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. That we realize that the Lord Jesus is our atonement. We rest in him as such, as our life. And then the believer who rests in the sovereignty of God, he, he has the assurance of his security. Where uh, God is sovereign, God is running this, running this universe, God has worked out our salvation, and God is the one who maintains it. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that the Lord Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, uh, God presents us... Uh, the Lord Jesus presents us faultless uh, to God because he presents us in himself. That's our position. And then, of course, our Father is a just God, and uh, we rest in his justice uh, to know that we're secure, to declare his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in the Lord Jesus. For Christ also hath once suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And uh, then the wonderful verse in Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Uh, the just and holy God has redeemed us, and who can, uh, who can turn that aside? And then the fact that uh, God is the one who engineered it all, God did it all. And so uh, we are to rest in the will of God uh, to know that we're secure. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And of God are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us redemption. So that uh, God introduced it all. He made the first move. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. We responded to what God gave. <clears throat> and then, of course, we, we depend upon uh, the love of God for our security. I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, uh, nothing. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution? For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
wonderful, wonderful facts of our relationship to Him. Now, why is it so important for the Christian to be very sure that he's saved and uh, be very sure that he's accepted and to be very sure that he's secure in the Lord Jesus Christ forever? Well, this is the foundation upon which the Christian can have a clear conscience. Because in our growth, in our Christian walk, there's going to be sin. There's bound to be sin. Uh, true, as we grow, there will be less and less of self and less sin, and there will be more and more of the Lord Jesus manifested, and, and more and more of his righteousness in our daily walk. That's our growth. But, of course, there will never be a time while we're in this body that there won't be any sin at all. We'll never be perfect in this body. So we have to realize that there's going to be sin. Well, when the Christian sins, that's, that's the thing that uh, cuts into his conscience and defiles his conscience. And he loses his rest and he loses his peace. And he, when this goes on for a time, he becomes discouraged because he finds that sin is stronger than he is. That which I would do, I do not, and that which I would not, that I do. And he begins to struggle with sin. And he finds that he has a defiled conscience. And he finds that he loses uh, the peace of God. And uh, at first he begins to think maybe he's lost his salvation, but of course he hasn't. He, he's lost his fellowship, but, uh, but not his relationship. His relationship to the Lord Jesus can never be changed. But in order for the Christian to uh, have a good conscience and to grow in the Lord uh, all during this process, God has provided a way to take care of the sins that occur during our walk here on earth. And that, of course, is by means of confession. They, the sins have already been uh, forgiven, but God wants us to uh, confess them and, and uh, admit it. And then we uh, come to realize that we no longer have those sins upon us so that we're free to fellowship with him again and he's free to fellowship with us. And our conscience is uh, cleared. And we're once again at peace with God. Well, what's happened with most believers today is that uh, the sins uh, are accumulating to such a great extent that they uh, finally give up in uh, any attempt really to confess them. And one reason, too, that Christians give up in confessing their sins to God is because they don't really believe that uh, the Lord Jesus uh, cleanses them from all the unrighteousness of those sins. They don't really believe that. They're not too sure about that. And so finally they just give up and try to make the best of their Christian life and uh, going along discouraged about themselves and uh, their... Uh, violated uh, conscience uh, causes them to be depressed. And most Christians that are suffering under uh, depression, the basic cause for this is sin, unconfessed sin. And uh, we've forgotten all about uh, 1 John 1.9 where God says if we confess our sins, uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, the Christian, most uh, Christians have really forgotten about the fact that the Lord Jesus is at the Father's right hand and he's our advocate. And that we have uh, the Comforter, we have an advocate within in the Holy Spirit, and he's the one who convicts us of our sin and uh, reveals our sin and uh, points us to the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood. The shed blood for cleansing that sin and uh, the living Lord Jesus in glory before the Father who is our advocate, who uh, presents us to God in himself, presents his finished work, and who restores our fellowship with himself and with our Father. And of course, uh, right in this instant, right in this area is where the uh, the enemy comes, and he uh, 
brings in the condemnation. He points his finger at us and our sinfulness, and he uh, causes discouragement, and he causes uh, depression, darkness, because he, he, he condemns. But uh, when the Christian realizes that there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, when he realizes uh, the, his relationship to the Lord Jesus and the fact that uh, the price has fully been paid and that he's uh, uh, saved and that he's accepted and that he's secure in Christ, why he won't let Satan push him down. The Holy Spirit never condemns. The Holy Spirit convicts, but he convicts in order to turn our faith and our eyes upon the Lord Jesus and his shed blood. And he, he, he turns us to cleansing, to confession and cleansing. Whereas the, whole, the, uh, the enemy would seek to turn us to self-condemnation and guilt. And of course that leads to the darkest of depression. That just turns everything off. And the, only the Christian who sees his real relationship to the Lord Jesus is going to be able to, by faith, is going to be able to uh, ignore Satan's condemnation. And he's going to rejoice in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, even when the Holy Spirit convicts. He's going to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work and his relationship to him. And uh, there's no discouragement in Christ. We think of this um, this verse, uh, these verses in Colossians one, where um, speaking of the Lord Jesus, having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your wicked mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And God has done all this work on our behalf in the Lord Jesus and placed us in him. And the Lord Jesus presents us before God unblameable and holy and unreprovable in God's sight because he sees us in his Son. Uh, Satan would point at us and, and uh, cause us to see our sinfulness in, in the old life, and he would uh, seek to make us uh, try to defend ourselves and try to justify ourselves and try to get ourselves straightened out so that we won't feel so guilty and so that we'll have a, a cleansed conscience. But no. The Holy Spirit's ministry is to turn us to the Lord Jesus, and there's no struggle to be good, and there's no effort to stop sinning. It's not on that basis at all. As we look to the Lord Jesus and rest in Him and depend upon Him, uh, His sinless life will more and more be uh, manifested. And it won't be a matter of trying to straighten out the old sinful life, but it'll be a matter of resting in His, his perfect life, in His uh, righteous life, and allowing Him to live in through us, to live through us. That's the rest of the Christian life. Anything else is a uh, futile struggle and failure. Anything else brings discouragement, self-condemnation, and ultimately leads to depression. So what, what um, our Father is, uh, he's inviting us, he's uh, asking us to, uh, to rest in, in his Son. And in Hebrews 10, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Well, our, we're never going to lose our evil conscience until we confess our sins uh, as they happen. Do admit it. God, God, uh, God knows it and he understands. And uh, he wants us to bring our sins to him. When the Christian doesn't realize this, and he feels that he's going to be punished, or he's not acceptable any longer, or he may even lose his salvation, why the first thing the Christian does, he attempts to hide his sin. 
and the attempts to uh, make excuses and uh, not admit that a thing is sin. So uh, without confessing his sin, uh, he doesn't realize that God has cleansed his sin away and uh, there's, a, there's a wall between him and God. His fellowship is cut off. There's a wall of sin there. And uh, that just throws the Christian more back on himself and it throws him under the condemnation of the enemy. It throws him under self-condemnation and he just can't function. He can't function in himself. He can't function with God. He can't function with others. And he becomes a spiritual wreck. And all the time uh, the word is saying, let us draw near to God with a true heart, honestly confessing our condition, and in full assurance of faith that uh, the Lord Jesus, as our advocate, will cleanse it all away. And his shed blood will take care of it all. And our hearts will be sprinkled from an evil conscience. And that's just what our Christians need today. They need to be able to walk in a clear conscience. Not, not depending upon themselves, depending upon who the Lord Jesus is and what he's done for them. And then in, in Hebrews 9, the word says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Well, that's why Christians aren't growing. That's why Christians aren't being used effectively, because they're uh, seeking to produce a lot of uh, work to be acceptable to God and to... Uh, maintain their salvation and to try to get a clear conscience and it's all dead works because it comes from self. And God is waiting for the Christian to get sick and tired of this and realize the futility of it and then he, the Holy Spirit, points him uh, up to the Lord Jesus in glory and he points him to the blood of Christ uh, that was offered to God without spot. And he realizes that he simply relies upon the finished work of the cross. And uh, that cleansing blood, as he confesses his sins, he realizes that his, con realizes that his conscience is purged, it's cleared. And that he's free to have fellowship with his Father. Uh, how can a Christian have fellowship with his Father day by day when he's, uh, he's all taken up with uh, his own sin and, and with self, struggling with all that? And his conscience is uh, blackened and uh, fouled and he's uh, discouraged and oppressed, he can't have fellowship with God, and all of his unconfessed sin blocks, it, blocks the fellowship anyway. And uh, most Christians today are in this condition. And all the time, um, our Father is saying that we, he's asking us to, to come boldly, under the throne of grace. Well, we did come boldly under the throne of grace in order to be saved, didn't we? And he accepted us freely, just as we were. Well, so many Christians, uh, all Christians know this, should know it, but so many Christians feel, well, yes, I, I'm saved by grace, but I have to live the Christian life by doing the best I can and getting God to help me. In other words, uh, the, the, the error that the Galatians were committing, uh, that they were in, that they were saved by grace and the, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit caused them to be saved and yet they were seeking to live the life in the, in the flesh, in the efforts of the flesh and uh, trying to be sanctified by self-effort, trying to grow by self-effort and of course with God's help. No, we are saved by grace and we live by grace. We're saved by faith and we're to live by faith. And that's the wonder of the Christian life. We're to come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, that's why God allows us to fail and to get into difficult places so that we realize our need and realize our need to the extent that uh, we can't meet it. And then we find that it's already met in the Lord Jesus. And the fact that uh, God has uh, uh, created us anew in Him, God has placed us in Him, and uh, God has seated us together in Him in the heavenlies. That our, our, the source of our Christian life is at God's right hand. Well, that's what He wants us to see. And that's uh, that realization 
the fact that we have died to the old life and we're alive in the new, that our, our Christian life is hid with Christ in God, that's what God wants us to see. There's where our peace is. There's where our clear conscience is. That's what keeps us in the in the attitude and the, the realization that we, we can fellowship with Him. That we're not all taken up with the self-life, that we can, we're free to be taken up with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, to uh, enjoy Him and uh, pray to Him and uh, talk with Him and to get to know Him better through the Word and to realize how uh, safe we are in Him and uh, to realize His purpose for us, that He's working night and day in our lives to conform us to His image, that we might be more and more like Him. Those are the facts that give us peace. And those are the facts that keep us from de being discouraged. And if, uh, if discouragement is kept out, uh, depression is never going to creep in. If we're able to uh, rejoice in the Lord Jesus, we're never going to be depressed. And we don't mean to say this, in, in the, we don't mean to give the impression that uh, there are never any difficult times and there are never any dark times in the Christian life, because uh, there certainly are. But it's not, it's not depression, it's not a faithless depression when uh, the Christian has to go through dark uh, periods, dark areas once in a while. Uh, those are times when uh, God develops our faith. When we're young in the Lord, why He takes us by the hand and leads us along and uh, gives us a lot of uh, blessings and feelings, and we, we, we have, to, as babes in Christ, we have to go along on that basis for a while. But then as we begin to grow, God makes it more difficult so that we'll mature and develop, so that we'll have to go more by faith. Faith in His faithfulness. So He takes more and more, He takes away the feelings. And more and more, He allows us to get into situations that we can't handle. And more and more, He allows us to fail, so that we come to know what the self-life is like. And all the time, He's building up needs in our life. Well, when the Christians don't realize what's happening, they uh, realize that they're failing more and more, and they become discouraged, and they become depressed. That's where so many Christians are today. And all the time, this is God's wonderful process to bring them along to uh, spiritual development. It's something to really to rejoice in. So, <clears throat> we, we must, uh, this one thing we must think about, no matter what the situation is now, no matter how long we've gone without uh, really confessing our sins to our Father, no matter how uh, careless we've been, uh, God is still waiting. God has been allowing this to uh, cause us to turn from ourself and to turn from Him. He's waiting. He's waiting in glory. He's waiting for our simple faith once more to come to Him and rejoice in Him. And uh, the reason He says we are to come boldly to the throne of grace is because it is a throne of grace, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ has made it possible that everything is cleared away, that there's no other way to come but to come boldly. It doesn't mean that we don't come humbly and, and in a needy manner, but we come uh, forthrightly and give Him the credit and the honor of having made the way possible. That's the boldness of it. And uh, that we might, uh, we're going to obtain mercy. He's the God of mercy. And He can be merciful to us because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done about our sin. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16 Well, that's what He's calling us to. Uh, to draw nearer with a true heart and full assurance of faith. And He'll sprinkle our hearts from an evil conscience. He'll renew our fellowship. He'll uh, enable us to realize that He's been using all of this for our uh, conditioning so that we can see that the Christian life is not our seeking to live for Him and serve Him, but we're to see that uh, only the Lord Jesus can live the Christian life in and through us. And we're now ready to uh, really begin to rely upon Him and really begin to uh, off look unto Jesus instead of paying attention to ourselves and all of our failures and all of our self-effort. We begin to uh, see him for who he is and what he's done and for what he's doing. Well, these, these are difficult days, but uh, they're not more difficult than the Lord can handle. 
he's he's uh, allowing them to, to become difficult so that we will find our all in his son so the basic thing is to spend some time now in the first John and to talk to our father admit our failures admit our weakness admit our sinfulness admit our specific sins and we'll find the cleansing of the blood we'll find the renewal of the fellowship and we'll find that our father has been waiting like the prodigal son uh, comes uh, rushing back to God see that's how that uh, that's how God worked it out with the prodigal son you remember it tells about when he was away and in the, in the in the sin that he uh, it says when he came to himself when he came to himself it says that no man uh, ministered unto him no man would feed him and he had to eat the husks of the swine and all when no man ministered unto him he came to himself and that's what God does he allows us to get into all sorts of things he allows us to find out what self is like and he does he seems like as though he doesn't help us at all and then when we come to ourselves, when we see ourselves, we turn, we arise, and say, I'll go to my Father. And uh, when we turn to our Father on that basis, when we come to ourselves, we turn to our Father, what do we find? We find our Father rushing toward us. And we find our Father giving us, uh, putting a ring on our finger and giving us a new cloak and uh, he kills the fatted calf, there's a, the feasting, there's the fellowship, there's uh God can't do enough for us. And w that's the way he treats us. All because we're in his son. And we're learning that the Christian life is not I, but Christ. Well, friends, you've been very patient. I do want you to feel to feel free to write at any time about these things. This has been uh, sketchy, but I, I've been seeking to share just some basic principles about how God works with us. And I invite you to write at any time about these things. If you're bothered by discouragement or uh, depression, just uh, write to Miles Stanford, Post Office Box 3035, Post Office Box 3035, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80907. 80907 is the zip code. And we'd be glad to hear from you. And we may be able to share some further thoughts with you or share some uh, literature with you that will be a help. But we don't want you to depend upon us. Uh, we want you to simply turn to the Father. And uh, He's in the light. The Lord Jesus is in the light. And every Christian is in Christ in the light. And there doesn't have to be the darkness of depression to hold, hold the Christian down. When the Christian sees that he's in his risen Lord. And that, uh, that the blood of Christ uh, will purge his conscience and cleanse him from all unrighteousness. Well, we, we want to thank the Lord for this time together. Our Father... We thank Thee for the agony of failure and of self-consciousness and the failure of self-effort. We thank Thee for all that because we know Thou dost allow that to bring us to the end of ourselves that we might uh, uh, truly turn to Thee as Christians and to find in experience and to find in the Word all that Thou hast done for us and prepared for us in our Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian life that is mature and steady and fruitful, the uh, civil war that can come to an end within, that we're usable of thee, that we're usable for the sake of others, that we've been through a lot of things, true, but only so that we understand what others are going through, only that we come to realize how faithful thou art, and how thou dost work, and how what thou dost do to mature a Christian, to bring a Christian along. So we do thank thee for thy faithfulness, we thank Thee for the Lord Jesus, for the patient ministry of the Holy Spirit deep within. And we pray that each one of us might uh, rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. We trust Thee for this in Jesus' name. Amen.